we feel broken when we just aren't ourselves anymore. And I really encourage you to embrace the weird and be fun and have fun and make the cheer. You know, we are weirdos. And if it doesn't work, then try something else. Because if, you know, we've had to fit into a box for too long and then all of a sudden we're out of that box and we're like, now what? It's going to feel really scary, but it's going to feel really good when you figure out what your different is and how you're going to use it. ADHD Rewired episode 371. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mention on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Here in three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We are here for our monthly live Q&A. It is March 9th. We are joined by the now entire ADHD Rewired podcast network. And I focus on the word entire because Brendan literally just joined us. It's good to see you, Brendan. Uh, let's first check in with all of our friends here. Uh, we'll start. Let's, Brendan, we'll start with you. How's it going? Going okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to probably hear a little bit more about how really it's going in a little bit. <laughs> That's sure. Brendan Mahan from ADHD Essentials. And we got Will Curb. Hey there, everybody. Will from Hacking Your ADHD. And just for all the listeners know, Will is now sporting a fantastic Kendall Art mustache. The similarities to, uh, um, what's his name from, uh, from MJ, you said his name before. Um, Ron Swanson. Thank you, Ron Swanson. Um, are striking. Um, we have MJ from the ADHD Diversified Podcast, which is now officially out. How's it going? It's going. It's, it's going. Good. It's fun. All right. And we have Moira Mabin. And by the time this is actually on the podcast, you could check out her podcast, The ADHD Friendly Lifestyle. How's it going, Moira? It's going really well. Awesome. And we have for starters, we have Maria who is going to kick us off with a question. So let's get Maria unmuted here. All right, Maria, what is your question? Hi. Um, so my question is, how do you go from the mindset I'm broken to I'm different to I'm different? And how can I use that to my advantage? Hmm. Um, so, you know, there's a mindset and there's kind of feeling it. So I think when you talk about mindset, part of it is making the decision to do so, knowing that your, the feelings will kind of trail that decision to sort of take on that mindset. Um, Maria, I, I don't know really anything about you, but I can promise you you're not broken, right? You know, it's. We may, we may have our emotional scars. I think we probably all do, right? We may feel like, you know, we're at a place in our life at this moment that this is not where we imagined uh, things to be. But I think that we can always find meaning in the hard stuff and use that to sort of inform how we move through life. Um, and I Hashtag think, growth mindset. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you, you know, and I think just recognizing that that's even a thing and asking this question is a great evidence of someone who is pursuing the life of living with a growth mindset. Oh, absolutely. So I was a teacher. Um, I totally crashed and burned that uh, career. <laughs> 
it's just really uh, pe- my peers who had the same uh, education that I've had. I just couldn't do the things they could do. And for the longest time, um, I felt broken. Um, I didn't know I had ADHD and I learned I did, which was kind of really helpful because I was like, oh, this is, this is why, this is why I couldn't do those things. Now I'm trying to move past that and figure out what can I do? (laughs) And there's a, um, a phrase that I first heard from uh, Ari Tuckman, um, who's a psychologist and he, he, uh, uh, he doesn't still do a podcast, but he does have a podcast uh, called More Attention, Less Deficit. And he says, you know, a late diagnosis, it does not change the past, it, but it does change our understanding of the past, right? And so it can help us, you know, with that to kind of move forward. Um, other thoughts on this? Moyer, go ahead. Brenda and I are both being very patient with each other. I know, I'm surprised. You, you, Usually you, 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 no, you, you two are the ones that like yeah. jump in right away. It's always a race between us, but I was like, yeah. ah, I'm going to wait. <laughs> Um, Maria, when I became a parent, I realized how much of who we are, which is a lot, we come that way. And it allowed me to be kinder to myself because when you're a woman with ADHD, especially, and especially I was a a woman with it. Oh my goodness. And I know I've was a teacher for 25 years. It's a, it's a system. Right. And you need to fit into that system if you're going to be successful. And if you're not, then it's really easy to give yourself these messages that aren't true. Um, And a lot of it is about, for me, at least, it's been about trying to be kinder to myself. And like we were doing this thing recently and it was uh, come up with something that's fun, quirky and interesting about yourself. And I'm like, I don't ride horses. I don't play a harp. Like I can't, you know skydive like I don't have a I don't have a thing and then I realized well I am really good at helping people and I love learning and I love learning about ADHD and so that can be my thing like that's not everybody likes to do that and I'm really good at that and so sometimes it's about taking that time to sort of peel back the layers and what is what is unique about you and it doesn't have to be in the way that it is for everybody else but if, if it makes you feel good and you enjoy it, then that's enough. Yeah, I play with this by working on the distinction between an excuse and a reason. Yeah. So, like, to me, an excuse kind of means that I don't have to worry about all the stuff that my problem, my ADHD, whatever the problem is that the ADHD has caused, Right. If I excuse it, then I'm not responsible for any of it, right? I don't have to worry about the fact that there is a problem. I don't have to worry about fixing the problem. I don't have to worry about what led up to the problem. I don't have to worry about any of it, going backwards or forwards. A reason is different. A reason means I don't have to carry the emotional load of the mistake. But I do kind of have to figure out why the mistake happened so that I can learn from it. Yeah. And I still have to carry the responsibility. I still have the responsibility to clean up whatever the mess is that happened as a result of that mistake. Right. Yes. That resonates with me. Okay. Yeah. And, and honestly, you're still going to carry some of the guilt and the shame. Like it's just going to happen, but we only want to carry like 20% of it. Right. Like that's plenty. And, and if you flip that on its head, it means that you're, magnifying the guilt and the shame like four times more powerful than it needs to be four or five times more powerful than it needs to be. Like it just doesn't need to be as big as we often make it. Um, and playing with this a little bit further, cause that I was late cause my kid is struggling and my kid is struggling with this question. Like at, at 12 years old, this is mm-hmm. pieces of what he's struggling with. Yeah. Um, and so I was talking to him a little while ago about how, one of the challenges of struggling and making mistakes and stuff is oftentimes it feels like the only way to motivate ourselves to try to fix the mistake is to feel really bad about the mistake and try to use those negative feelings to smash our way through the wall of all and 
take action to fix the problem, but it doesn't really work. Like it seems like it would work, but more often than not, it just turns into a quagmire and we get trapped in those negative feelings of reduced self-worth and loathing. And then we still can't take action. So the trick is to figure out how can we accept that the problem happened, accept that the mistake has occurred and there's need, something needs to get solved and kind of be aggravated by it, but not be sad about it. If that makes sense. Like, yeah. And sort of use that aggravation maybe to move forward or, or on the other side of that, I mentioned you still have the responsibility to clean up the mess. Some of us are motivated by responsibility. Some of us find a great deal of power in responsibility. And if that's you do that, whatever, whatever sort of emotional trigger is going to help you take action. But that emotion is not guilt and shame. Those typically don't help us take action. And I would add to that too, that, you know, uh, this idea of like, it's okay to have regrets. Like, you know, to not have regrets kind of means that maybe you're a sociopath. So like, <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> right. So and truly it's like, yeah, I've heard in things the are kindest re- way possible. Right. Or the, you just haven't done anything. <laughs> right. And, and most people also say they have more regret over the things that they sort of didn't do versus the things that they did. Right. But I, do you want to, to answer part of the, address part of the question um, that you asked, how do you, use this I'm different right I think like I think the more people who show up and are able to sort of own their differentness right in a kind of unapologetic way not in a way that says like oh I'm ADHD deal with my mess but like like yeah I do this differently and this is how this is how I roll right and it's like if you want to hang out and let's let's roll look great if if not you know have a nice day right I think I think the world needs more courageous people like that this is what you need to do you need to get into the habit of going, I'm a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> Already do that. <laughs> oh my God. My, I just my, need my, to my, find the my, other weirdos. Yes. My son has totally taken on, like he, he loves the, like identifying as a weirdo and I love it. Will, you have something? A great book that covers the idea of using your disadvantage as an advantage is uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, David and Goliath. Um, and a lot of it's just because because you have some sort of disadvantage, you're forced to look at uh, problems in a different light. And because you're looking at the problems differently, you come up with different solutions. And those different solutions can be way better than just the typical solution. That's awesome. Uh, I have something. Go ahead. So I, I kind of want to address the the brokenness. And I think... As much as that brokenness sucks, we can almost use it as a litmus of like what happened and what caused that feeling of brokenness and and find out what the next step is so that we don't, you know, it, it's, it's the place that we don't want to go back to, but maybe we're, we feel broken because we gave ourselves up. And the problem with that is that it makes us feel different, not in a way that's, that's good because different is good because there's always different perspectives everywhere and having, you know, different eyes on different things is really, really useful, but we feel broken when we just aren't ourselves anymore. And I really encourage you to embrace the weird and be fun and have fun and make the cheer. You know, we are weirdos. And if it doesn't work, then try something else. Cause if, you know, we've had to fit into a box for too long and then all of a sudden we're out of that box and we're like, now what? It's going to feel really scary, but it's going to feel really good when you figure out what your different is and how you're going to use it. All right, let's take another question. We have about six questions in the queue. I don't know if any of them want to go live, though. And Nick, I don't think, did want to go live. So let's just ask his question. And Nick asks, how to navigate serious relationship troubles with a non-ADHD spouse? Take a class together. Take a class on ADHD. Go to a webinar. Go to a somebody. Learn about ADHD together so that your spouse can come to see how you operate 
And you at least have the illusion of taking responsibility for your own ADHD challenges. And I don't mean to say illusion like you're not ready to take that responsibility. I mean, you probably are already taking that responsibility, but they're not seeing it. So they need to see that you're doing it. And this will help them do that. I had to ask for a birthday present from my husband that he learned more about ADHD. But part of it was he has un, he has undiagnosed dyslexia and we're quite sure he has it. Our son has it. And, um, and I would leave him books. And once he started listening to podcasts, so finding a way that works, but yeah, we, we do stuff together. And then we also talk about how it's different for us because a lot of the stuff they talk about with like, it's more often than not, they're talking about the man having ADHD and the woman coming in and dealing with having to manage everything in the dynamics that that caused. Our situation is different because my husband doesn't have ADHD, but he is okay with disorganization and I'm not. Like there's a lot of things that I am still as the wife taking responsibility for. And the more I learn about my own ADHD, I'm like, well, wait. But yeah, just trying to find ways that work for each person. And there are people out there who specialize in relationships and ADHD. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure. I... I I've been considering over the next couple of years as this to be an area that I'd really kind of do a much deeper dive uh, into as someone who is uh, just coming off of uh, uh, getting divorced. Um, and I really strongly recommend that uh, for any of us who are in, in a relationship to really understand what our attachment styles sort of are and what that means and what it means when our attachment um, sort of system is activated all right, because it's not just like this preference. It's this it's this system that can get activated. And what happens when we're feeling, you know, different ways? So whether it's, it's a, an anxious uh, attachment or avoiding attachment or or secure, like what like what do we need to to uh, sort of thrive in our relationships? And, and you know, I do suspect that there's a lot of both anxious and avoiding attachment uh, in in ADHD. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think if both partners are, are willing to work on it, like I think there's a lot of reasons for hope, right? Um, I think when, when only one partner wants to work on it, that's when it's really, really hard. One of the best pieces of advice I got too was also applies to parenting is because I was looking at the serious relationship troubles, not trying to solve the relationship problems in the middle of a, an, an event, right? Like if there's something going on, you're trying to get through that. And then if you're trying to work on your relationship, you need to do that at times where when people are okay. Well, and I think uh, part of that working on what it's not okay or working on things when things are okay, you have to schedule that ahead of time because you're not going to be like, hey, I'm in the mood to do this. Um, and so that's one reason that like having like marriage counseling and that kind of stuff really helps just because that just creates a schedule that does it and has a third party to help facilitate things. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? A lot of it, like one of the things that I always find interesting about my parent groups that I run is I keep getting feedback that they've helped people's marriages, which is not the plan <laughs> for the I'm coaching groups. But because, and not because it made the kids stuff easier, but because I focus so heavily on connection and communication and anxiety and hitting those three things. I've had a lot of people, a lot of people come through the groups who are like, oh yeah, my, my marriage is better. So paying attention to connecting with your spouse, even when things are hard, even because it just making those connection moments might ease some of that tension, um, paying attention to how you communicate and improving that communication. So it's more ADHD friendly, like don't just talk, write stuff down, some messages, especially if it's like, I need you to do this thing. Get that written down, not as like a contract and pressure, but because the ADHD person might forget and having it written down will help. Um, even just the power of emojis. My wife sent me a text today about three things that I need to do that I keep flaking on. And she sent the text, which I would have been like, Ugh, like I wouldn't have been upset because I know I need to do it, but I would have had that little like bristly moment that every ADHD person has the, uh, whenever they're reminded of what I, they have to do. I know. Right. Yeah. Right. But along with the text, you sent a little emoji of like a kissy face heart thing, which diffuses that totally. like, uh, cause it's like, oh yeah, that's her being aware of that bristle. 
and reminding me that this comes from a place of love, right? So those kinds of things can be helpful too. All right, let's do one more question and then we'll go to break. So the truncated version of this uh, question is, I messed up a deadline as a freelancer. Um, and just to the context of that is she was helping her parents. And now I want to apply for a job at the same place. How do I position myself? My first thought would be to own it and just like, a, you know, a, I guess address the issue and what was going on. And um, especially in the context of, so it sounds like you're helping your, your parents we're in COVID, like nothing is normal right now. Um, so I think if, if, if otherwise your work has been quality, right. And this is just this one issue um, to me, I don't think it's like my guess might be that it's not as big of an issue as maybe you're thinking it is potentially. Um, let us know if you want to go live so we can kind of uh, dialogue with you about this. Moira. She did say that like, she got a talk, like, why would you risk, future work with us and it sounds like there was a lot of things going on and a lot of them are related to kind of the shit show of pandemic life right now and I think you're like I would agree to own it and just say you know th that there were multiple things and maybe speak to one or two other experiences in your life where that's not been the norm or a way that they some other way where you have shown that you can do this um, and recognize, yeah, just recognize the position that they might be in, but also give them a rationalization of why they, they can, you can do this. Because even that in an employee is something that you want, right? Someone who's going to own their shit. I, I can only see the truncated version because I came in late, I think. So I'm not seeing the longer version, but judging from the truncated version, stop guessing. If you were a freelancer, you have relationships with people who work at that company. Talk to them. You don't have to talk to the one that like you think you ticked off by missing a deadline or whatever, but there's got to be other people there that you know. Talk to them. Find out what your reputation is after having been a freelancer there and missing this deadline. Do they even care? You might be one of 40 freelancers who all missed deadlines and the other 39 might have missed three deadlines and you only missed one. Like get more information so that you're not in a position of having to guess. And then if you do have those relationships, leverage them to try to get the interview and try to get this job. We got Jillian on now. Oh, rock Hi on. there. Hey, Hi there. Jillian. Um, yeah, this is my first time. Sorry. So I wasn't quite sure how that worked. No worries. Um, uh, I will give a little more context, which is that um, it was a big deal. It's a small organization and I, you're probably right that I'm like over contextualizing in my head. And I'm basically like, do I tell them I have ADHD? Do I tell them that, um, you know, I'm just beating myself up because I feel like I, I ruined pants to have this great job with these great people. They're great people. And I, um, I, I mess up a deadline that, you know, could have cost them like this huge grant. And so I, I, I got a talking to from sort of like the head of everything. So it, it's clear that it was a big deal. And I, I don't even know what my reputation is because I'm always quietly scrambling with deadlines. So I don't know how much they can see that, but I know that they saw it in one huge way. And I tend to probably overly divulge and apologize, you know, when I think that, I've done something wrong in the interest of being like authentic and real and owning stuff. So yeah, like I've spent all morning trying to write this heavy, long letter with like, well, I used to be really together, but I was, I hit overwhelm and I, you know, I, I, I was ineffective and I'm addressing it and I'm going to coaching and Eric, I'm trying to go to your class because I really want to, because I have ADHD and I just wonder, am I always going to self-sabotage like, like this? You know, it's just, I, I'm constantly like, should I get a different career? Should I be a nurse? Because even though I'm creative, I just am not um, uh, consistent, you know? Well, you know, and speaking of uh, sort of consistency, you know, one of the things we talk about in, in our coaching groups is that consistency is more of an, an average of outcome, not the goal. The goal is resilience, is like get back up when you slip, 
like, and you can skip the part where you beat yourself up, right? When you recognize that you've slipped, right? It's like, all right, what's, what's the first step to get back up? Even if it's, you're getting back up to a place that's not quite where you were, like you'll get to where you were more quickly, the sooner you get back up, right? The one thing I can tell you doing is that like the one way to guarantee that you don't get this job is to do nothing. Right. Yeah. Right. So like what I would do is out if you have someone that you can, uh, so you say you draft mail, um, let somebody that you trust read it first before you send it. Yeah. Right. That, that you trust that will give you honest feedback and tell you, because typically uh, in most scenarios, I would discourage disclosing, especially in a job interview. Right. Because like, m- like assume whatever, like the worst stereotype of ADHD is assume that's their understanding of ADHD. Right. So I closed out my pre COVID life by volunteering at a maximum security prison in California. And what I was doing there was talking to inmates about how to bounce back, right? How to get a job, how to get parole, all that kind of stuff. So I murdered a guy committed assault or armed robbery is significantly harder to get past than I missed a deadline. (laughs) But the advice remains the same. I made this mistake. This is what I've learned from it. This is how I've changed. Or these are the things I'm doing to improve my situation. I deserve to bounce back because I'm taking these steps. Acknowledge the elephants in the room. Don't like celebrate the elephant in the room. Yeah. Just I made the mistake and then this is what I'm doing about it. Not this is why I made the mistake or any of that stuff. That's not what you want to do. And then shift the focus to your assets. Like why are you valuable? Why will you be valuable to this company? Right. Right. MJ, I think you had something you wanted to add to it. At least you had it one moment and then maybe I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I wrote something down and then I don't know what this means anymore. So (laughs) how many times a day do we all do that? I mean, it's like my desk is filled with sticky notes that can be described that way. (laughs) (laughs) So we're moving on. So let's move on to a break. Julian, I hope that this was helpful for you. Thank you. Awesome. I hope to see you on uh, on Thursday if you are considering uh, coming to our, our next coaching group. Awesome. Thanks. We are going to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we will be back with more questions from you. So we will be right back. Our 24th season of coaching and accountability groups is now underway. If you missed your chance to join us for our spring sessions or we decided to wait until summer, go to coachingrewired.com and click on the red button to get your name added to the summer coaching interest list. Keep listening every week. We might just have an early registration event for our upcoming summer sessions. Okay, it's not quite summer yet, and maybe I'm just really excited for summer because that means more pickleball, but it's also good news for you. Summer will come sooner than we think. So there will be more spots available for our coaching and accountability groups. Have a question? We've added a frequently asked question section to the website homepage. And I think we maybe hit a little bug on the website last week where some of the questions weren't showing up, but we have fixed that. Head on over to coachingrewired.com to find out more and to get your name added to our summer interest list. That's Coaching Rewired. It's already the second week of April. If you were listening to this episode on the day it came out, and it's still early enough in your day, head on over to ADHDrewired.com slash events so you can register and join us today for our live Q&A with all of our podcasters on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. That's today at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Need help keeping track of our growing Rewired podcast family? Then go to ADHDrewired.com and click on the drop down menu for podcasts. And select the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network to find links to all of our podcasts and ways to subscribe. There you will find ADHD Essentials with Brenda Mahan, Hacking Your ADHD, 
ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens, and now actually out and live, the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle with Moira Maven. And remember, you can join us every second Tuesday of the month to meet all of your podcasters at each of our monthly live Q&As. Again, if you are listening to this on the day it came out, join us today for our live Q&A, April 13th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. To register, go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. We hope to see you there. And we are back. All right, uh, Mark, you have a question about medication. So even with, he says, even with medication, uh, I'm still extremely and easily distracted. What tools can I use to interrupt those distractions? All right, so I'm using one of them right now. Um, Bose noise-canceling headphones are amazing. Um, I'm so distracted by sounds and uh, one of the things that besides just the, the, the fact that it's good noise canceling technology, I can wear these all day comfortably. Um, now, I have heard different things from different people if they wear glasses. Um, I think the most over the ear ones maybe can be challenging with glasses. Um, but as far as like for uh, distraction from sounds, I would recommend uh, some noise canceling headphones or even a white noise machine. Will, what do you got? Yeah, the whole pills don't teach skills thing is definitely a big deal because you think i'm just gonna take meds and it's gonna make things happen but if you're doing the same things you're gonna have the same results just more focused like i remember when i first went on medication i'm like i can answer 20 reddit questions in a day now that not (laughs) not helpful uh so yeah making sure you're keeping away from those distractions i use a program called freedom on my computer that locks me out of uh distracting websites because I will just be like absentmindedly like, oh, I'm just going to check Facebook for no reason at all in the middle of the day and then get distracted by it. Um, also, turning all those notifications off on your phone, all the th- little things that you can do to be like, I can just make it so that my work is streamlined and I can not be interrupted. Right. Because we want to make it worse. You don't have to try hard to stay focused from a distraction. We want to try to circumvent the distraction in the first place. Right. Um, I know for me, uh, adult study hall, um, is so helpful, especially if I'm working on a task that would fall into the category of an, I don't want to, right? Like I was doing some, uh, tax prep document like stuff, uh, yesterday in, uh, an adult study hall on zoom. Um, and we're, we're actually launching that, uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, adultstudyhall.com. You can learn more about that. Um, well, what do you do to, uh, sort of prevent distraction? Um, I took a strategy from Will. I have a list of the things I'm not going to do. Um, I have to have no red dots, like the badge things. Um, I like to make sure that my medication is optimized because sometimes we should think, right? So, cause especially if it's extremely and easily for this person is, is that, um, physical activity. There's a lot of research that shows physical activity improves executive function and uh um so that really helps but having fewer things to do right yeah. so that you're trying to divert your focus less helps and then alarms like i have to do alarms for transitions so that i can remember what i'm supposed to be doing when remember those science fair boards those like threefold love like, those those are put that on your desk like block yeah. out the visual stimuli yeah. Right. You can. Yeah. I actually have like 20 of them that I would use that anybody could use them that you just basically called your own privacy screen. So, That's great. yeah. MJ, what do you use to uh, minimize distraction? Well, so when we're in the study hall, um, I I usually take this down after group sessions and stuff. So she has but a, I actually a white, leave like, it, it's like a blanket thingy, yeah, behind. So, yeah. Like the rest of the house is behind me. Um, but I find because like we have a dog and we have a cat and I have an ADHD partner. And sometimes if even though this is on screen and the zoom rooms up, if I see something run past me on screen, I'm like, what was that? Then I'm like, Oh, what are you doing? And then, you know, it just kind of, you know, everything grabs 
my attention. It's and there's a window here, and actually this blocks the, the the like being able to look outside because if I see a bird or a squirrel or some a neighbor walking their dog, I'm like, oh, what are they doing? Um, and the other thing, I don't know if this is applicable, but if you have other people or if you have a family and you've got kids, I don't have kids, but um, I think there's also something to be said of when you're trying to work on something is finding ways to protect your time because yes, you can have the medication and yes, it's like, you might think, okay, I'm going to be less distracted, but to sort of latch on to the pills don't teach skills. Pills also don't teach boundaries when we're trying to get things done. So um, as difficult as that can be, when everything just feels like an emergency, I think we have to give ourselves permission to like carve out that time for ourselves and then give ourselves a little bit more grace to not feel bad for carving out that time for ourselves because there is only so much time in a day and the more distractions we have, the less will get done. So to also latch on to, you know, take stuff off your list or have less to do during your day will also be helpful. So it's just a recipe of different things to try until you find your right flavor. Awesome. Yeah, well. And to add on to that, schedule that time to do all that other fun stuff too. We tend to have this like all or nothing. I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. going to make all my time distraction free. And it's like, oh, make time for your kids. Make time to play with your dogs. Make time to play video games. All the stuff you want to do. Because if you completely deprive yourself of it, you're just going to find that you're craving to do it more and more. Right. The our brain has this default no, uh, mode network that where where mind wandering occurs, and it's going to go there whether you create time for it or not. So I would encourage you to actually create time to allow yeah. your mind to wander. Nutrient rich boredom. That's when I stay up late. I got a whole podcast episode on it. <laughs> Nutrient when rich I, boredom. That's the title I, of the podcast episode. Yeah. Nice. It, when I don't allow the free range, I will stay up late doing it. But when I allow for it, I can go to bed on time. And here's the thing, too. I mean, managing ADHD is about experimenting with a freaking gazillion and one different strategies. Right. And like you find the 10 to 20 that really become essential to you. Right. Like that's managing ADHD. I was teaching. I was a special ed teacher. I don't know, two or three years ago. And there's a kid in the class who he was like kind of a. I don't want to say troubly kid, entertaining kid. He was like the kid who just had ADHD, had good intentions, but was still distracting like that kid. So he's playing with a fidget spinner. He was on fire. Like he was answering everything totally on the game. Like I'd never seen him before playing with a fidget spinner and come to find out like midway through class, he was chewing two different flavors of gum, keeping one on one side of his mouth and one flavor on the other side of his mouth, mint and fruit. And playing with a fidget spinner. He had like so many fidgets happening. And that was why he was so focused and on task. So fidget too. I love that idea. I, you know, I like a year or so ago, I like rediscovered gum. And Gum's like, a magic. It's magic. It does. It's crazy how like how much it helps. I make sure I don't run out of gum. I have Amazon subscribe and save. Send me my, uh, uh, what do I chew? Uh, Orbit? Big League Chew. Orbit orbit not sponsored all right um let's uh let's see this let's take one more quick break and uh, when we come back we will answer another question so we will be right back have you been looking for a co-working space to help cross things off your list well look no further head on over to adultstudyhall.com to find out more about a brand new membership program for the adhd community the virtual doors will be opening soon to our adult study hall membership community where you can boost your productivity with real-time accountability over Zoom. If you've signed up to join this new community, I promise we're getting there. We're getting closer every week. For real, we are. It will be worth the wait. Did you know? We'll be offering a variety of adult study hall or ASH sessions from adult study hall on demand to member hosted sessions where you can post what time you want to be in adult study hall and anyone in the community can join you. There are currently five ongoing member hosted study halls scheduled Monday through Friday. 
Also included in the membership are the Ash Plus sessions, which will be facilitated working sessions to provide some structure and help to help you get the things done through intentional questions and progress check-ins. Our Adult Study Hall membership will give you a virtually around-the-clock accountability so you don't have to work alone and you can finally get stuff done. Membership is just $19.99 a month, which includes all member hosted study halls and access to all ASH Plus sessions. And the first 100 members to lock in their membership will do so for just $9.99 a month as the founding members of the Adult Study Hall community. As long as your membership stays active and you remain in good standing, your founder's rate will never increase for the lifetime of your membership. Go to adultstudyhall.com and add your name to the list to get your chance on locking in our founder's rate of only $9.99 a month. And then watch your email. That's adultstudyhall.com. ADHD Rewired is supported by our patrons over on Patreon. Check us out at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon, where there's a level for everyone. Patrons can have access to different perks like ad-free episodes, early releases, monthly coaching calls, and more, all depending on the amount of your monthly contribution. I want to welcome our newest member, Martin H., at the $5 a month level. Thank you so much for your contributions and welcome to our Patreon community. So what about those perks? Well, Patreon members who contribute at the $25 a month level can join me for our group coaching call that we do for all of our patrons every fourth Tuesday of the month at 3 p.m. Central. That's 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Our next Patreon coaching call is on Tuesday, April 27th at 3 p.m. Central. That's 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. So you can listen to ADHD Rewired ad free. But if you don't mind the ads and you're able to show a bit of financial support because you find a value in each and every episode, you can still contribute at the $3 a month level. Find out more about our Patreon community and perks for each level at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And we're really grateful for any contribution you're able to give. And right now, if the cards don't quite line up for you to show financial support, that's okay too. I appreciate everyone, from our listeners to our patrons, our coaching group members, alumni community, and our Facebook community. Thank you for all of your support, your encouragement, and your feedback. You all make ADHD Rewired the amazing place it is. So thank you. And we are back. All right. Uh, Let's see. Rhonda. Um, Question is, how do you relate to an 18 year old who fights for independence yet hasn't shown good decision making skills to rebuild the independence he used to have? I really like this question because it sounds like it could have been me when I was 18. Um, So part of, and this is, this is hard. I think probably for any parent is when your kids sort of at this, this stage, um, it's how do you give them that space to make mistakes that they can learn from without like landing up in jail. Um, and, and, and I don't know what that, that, uh, what the, all the situation is there, but you know, it's one of the things I think it's important to keep in mind that I think that and this is probably true. Even as adults, I think we are our worst selves with our parents, right? Like, so maybe he's really not getting his shit together when he's around you and like the things that you're asking him to do. It's possible he's doing a bit better in other areas. Um, you know, and I, I think that uh, giving him like choices, the opportunity to learn from the, the results of those choices, I think is, is important. You know, he's 18, which yes, developmentally he's more like 15, 16, but he is 18. And if he's pushing back, like there's no amount, I think of like, you know, cajoling that you could do as a parent, that's going to get him to do the things you want to do. You know, I remember um, one of the things when I was in, in college, um, I was dating this girl for a while and, um, 
I, I really applaud my parents for how they approach this because they like they did not like this girl at all. Like um, and I understand why um, I didn't at the time, though. I, I, you know, it's I was 18, 19 years old and I was in love. And um, my my mom told me at a later point that um, they made this very intentional decision to not lead on to the fact that they could not stand her. And it probably was the best because who the hell knows what I would have done if I knew that I'm, my parents didn't like her. Um, I would hate to think that I would have gotten married to this person. Um, but like, so it's the idea of like, we have to sort of instill this, this belief, I think that we trust them one that they're going to make not just like the right decisions, but when they make the wrong ones that they're going to learn from them. Right. And I think that's a really important thing that we instill in our kids. Brendan. One of the things I'm encountering with the parents that I'm working with right now is their kids are making decisions that are to the parents norms and perspectives, bad decisions and often not bad necessarily, but like wrong, like morally objectionable, like that kind of stuff. But, uh, norms change and there's been a lot of norm change in our culture over the last 20 or so years. So it's entirely possible that your gut response to some of the choices your kids are making don't have the same kind of oppositionality that you might be experiencing. An area where I see this a lot is around marijuana use. I have, I talk to a lot of parents who are like sort of there's this moral indignation about their kids using pot And the kids don't get it. Like they don't understand why there's anything morally objectionable to be indignant about when it comes to marijuana, which is has nothing to do with like the effects on the brain and whether or not it's a good decision for someone with ADHD to do. Like, that's not where I'm going with this. It's just there's a lot of stuff that's charged sort of morally, for lack of a better word, with older with the older generations and our younger kids aren't having the same experiences that we've had. So. Because this is a kind of vague question, I want to throw that out and we there in case it's something now, useful so in there. Oh, us, okay, yeah. cool. So, Rhonda, cool. give us give us some uh, some context here. Okay, some background is that he is an Eagle Scout, and but he discovered vaping through either at Scouts or Office Scouts, and since then his attitude has kind of gone hit downhill. And for me, it's not vaping not being a moral um, morality thing for me being a caregiver of seniors who vape and are on oxygen and are 90 years old and my dad who has COPD from smoking um, and the difference that I see in him either coming down from this medicine or him coming in to see me, me seeing a difference in his face when he has been vaping. And he's saying that the vaping is better than the medicine. There may be some truth to that. Uh, And there, there is right now clinical uh, trials underway looking at uh, nicotine receptors for pharmacological uh, uh, treatment for ADHD. Right. Um, but, I, how, but how do we solve the lung issue? Right. So and I'll tell you this, as an ex-smoker, um, I mean, I started smoking stupid early. Um, I mean, I was, you know, I, I was a kid that was like pulling out cigarettes from the ashtrays. Like, I mean, gross. Right. Like I was 13, probably. Um, so I haven't I haven't smoked in, since I was like, I think, 23, 24. I'm now 40. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, and we know that there's higher rates of smoking with, with ADHD. Um, you know, it was, what's so hard is that like, you can't make them want it. Right. And that's, that's got to feel so, so helpless as a parent. I'm trying to lead the, lead him in a direction where he has a bunch of positive things that happen to him. So he can see that the smoking is not necessarily needed. That um, I think that like you're probably not the person to do it because your mom. 
right? And I know that sucks to hear, Mm -hmm. but like, it's, I think that love him and let him know that you believe in him. Um, Focus on sort of embellishing on what's going right in the relationship. Because if you're, if all the interactions, are you just telling him the things that you disapprove of? Like you're just going to push him further and further away. I know how hard that is because you're scared. And I, you know, you may want to actually consider reading nonviolent communication. Um, I think it, it really lays out a nice framework for um, really just sharing what it is that you are, like what you want and need, sharing what your feelings are without trying to get that other person to to change. Um, you know, it's not the goal of nonviolent communication. It's really just to communicate and have open dialogue Um you know, so like sharing that you're scared because of what you, you know, of your own father and the work that you do, um, what you see. And but I think that really like taking interest in what he's interested in, um, you know, not making comments that he smells and all that kind of stuff from whatever if he does from the vaping. Um, you know, he knows how you, you think and feel about it. Like without a doubt, he knows. Right. So I think what's most important is your relationship with him. So. um he used to have freedom with a car. He ended up losing his car through bad decisions. Um, losing it through you or the law? A little bit of both. Okay. He decided to allow a friend of his um, to drive his car when he was visiting a girl in Lincoln, which is about an hour away. It didn't tell us. You know, it's a big old long story. It got um, his friend ended up wrecking it and mm. it was totaled. And so he hasn't had the freedom that he used to have. So that's um, affected his attitude. The the stress of senior year has affected his attitude, um, which I've told him over and over again. Senior year in a pandemic, keep in mind. Yeah, I've told him over and over again that I know the stress of senior year and... um, so forth he um has a plan to go to do auto mechanics but he doesn't know where um like you were saying with the whole girl thing following the girl um he wants to do that she's going to iowa state in ames which is about four hours from omaha and he wants to go to community college which in des moines which looks like a good idea you know because of the focus that they have but um, the cost will be twice as much as if he stayed home. Um, twice as much, though, for yeah, in community college. You know, it's like we're not talking right. about a private institution. Yeah. Um, only because the community college doesn't have dorm. They have um, apartment living. Mm-hmm. So you have to come up with your own money and your own food. So it's like room and board's not included um and he could take auto mechanics classes through um a metro community college here in omaha and um live at home but i don't know what the difference is as far as the focus and um the back-to-back stuff um Also, I looked at that program and it has physics and he didn't take physics in high school. Um, It had sociology and psychology um, with relationship to, you know, the work world and stuff. And he's failed both of those in his senior year. Um, So it's, um, I know he will figure out what he needs to do. I know the path is going to be way different than I think it's going to be. But my thing is trying to figure out how to encourage him to set up his own plan, give that to us, and then we can say, okay, we've crunched the numbers. This is what your plan looks like. This is what our plan looks like do you want to be in debt for the rest of your life or, you know, and figure out which, and that's the choice that I'm trying to get him to understand. You see what I'm coming from? I, I do. I, I hear that. I hear a lot of fear 
that he's going to make <laughs> these wrong decisions. Yeah. Right. And that these wrong decisions are going to be like, you know, something that he, that can't be fixed. Right. And I think like for mo- most of us, we, we're going to screw up at stuff. And I think that, you know, if we, if, and then I'll, I'll just speak for myself. If I, if there's something that's hard, but I feel like I have a bailout, like I won't, like it won't push me to figure it out. When I feel I'm sort of like backed into a corner, like it's on me to figure it out. Like genuinely on me and no one's coming to rescue me. Like yeah. my brain turns on and I figure it out. And so I'm, I'm, it, I think that from, from what I'm hearing, and I'm sure there's a lot more sort of stuff that, that uh, goes into to your specific scenario, but keep reassuring him that you have, uh, that you believe that not only will he, will he figure it out that if he does make the wrong decision, what, uh, that he will learn from it. And, you know, um, and you can show you're scared, like you're, that you're scared he's going to make the wrong decision. And you also believe that he'll, that he will be able to learn from it and that you're just, you just want to see him, you know, do, do all right. Um, MJ, you were saying something in the chat. Would you, would you uh, verbalize that? I guess, and and we can, if you want to pin this for yourself, um, Rhonda, I guess the the couple of questions that I have, um, if you haven't already, is have you had like a solid chance to just sit down and ask him what he wants without trying to problem solve for him and just let him verbalize it out? And if you have, um, have you communicated with him that if this plan doesn't work, that that's okay and that it is okay to make mistakes because I think um, as much as we want reassurance for ourselves or I I think about my parents and as much as they wanted me to have this plan and, and do really, really well um, the more and more they, they wanted me to do something that I wasn't interested in or like tried to maybe push me in a direction that I was like, Oh, like I could do that, but I don't really want to. Like the more I was just like, I now I'm really not going to do that. And I don't think it was ever really communicated to me that making a mistake or making my own choices was OK. Um, and I, I wonder how that would affect um, your son if it's, you know, the decisions that he might want to try to make on his own, that if it's always well there's a difference between I don't want that for you and that's the wrong decision is creating I almost s- like this inferiority complex. And I, I, I don't know. It's just, I support his decision to go to mm-hmm. Des Moines to the community college because um, I can see good in that. Mm-hmm. My husband does not because he doesn't have a job right now to save up money to even um, be in a place where he could move out there. He doesn't have a car. Um, he's going to have to have money set aside until he gets a job out there in order to be able to afford food and rent. We can not support a thousand dollar rent and food, you know, $400 a month for food for him on top of our own expenses, mm-hmm. unless we work three jobs. <laughs> so what if um, another option would be, because I, I took this option for myself, is I took a year to work and to save up some money. And then I moved out after hey. I saved up. And even though they wanted me to go back to school right away, I was like, no, I need, I need to save money because I don't think you, you can't be paying for my stuff. And yeah. I split up at that point. So Mm, I just had to go on my own anyway. Well, and, and like my husband had a exorbitant amount of debt when we got married, I ended up going to travel school for nine months and then, you know, kind of worked my way back to where I'm at and ended up going to school at the age of 25. So I know what it's like to try and go to school and work full time. Um, Gary knows what it's like to, go to school and find out you don't want to do what you went to school for and have an exorbitant amount of debt. So it's, 
finding that balance for him. And like I said, he wants to follow the girl. And that's the worst part of it (laughs) because she's going to school for a veterinarian, which is great, but she's going to be in school for eight years. The only thing that I'll finish off with for myself is that I went to college once and I dropped out and it took me, uh, math is hard. I don't know. Three years ago, I think now I, I decided to go back and God, it sucks being in debt. And it's just like, that's the decision that I made and I have to live with it. And I mm-hmm. think, you know, there's, there's always just going to be decisions, whether our, our parents are there to guide us or not, that we're going to make, that we're going to look, look back and be like, what the heck? And I think that's okay. Yeah. Cause I'm still learning from it. And the more I learn, the, I hope the better I am. <laughs> That's all we can hope for. But yeah. the following the girl part, I'm not sure how, how to. Yeah, I mean, that, that could go one way or the other. I mean, that could actually be a yeah. really positive thing, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, but again, it's like being able to figure it out and make the mistakes. You know, it's, uh, I say that Miss Takes has been the most influential teacher I've ever had. And right. what is his backup plan? Is it going to be us bailing him out? <laughs> well, I think before you even go into it, consider what are you willing to do, right? Don't necessarily even tell him that, but yeah. have a knowledge of what you're willing to do. Yeah. Moira? Um, so I, I think with the financial piece, I think anyone is within their rights to say, this is what we're able to do and what we're not able to do, right? Mm-hmm. So that's one piece of it is, if you have to put limits on it because of that, that's like, because yeah, you shouldn't have to work three jobs. Um, the other thing is um, going back to his health and your concern about that. Um, I know is like from the moment kids are born, everything they do is about them going further away from us. And, you know, you're in a really big life change for both of you. Um And what have I've had to, because I have two very independent kids, is I have to, I've come to the realization that the best I can do is role model. And so doing the work that I need to do to be the healthiest I can be and making my own decisions for myself that show that I'm worth something and I'm a priority and trying to live that example because I also had, you know, parents who had health issues and, and a dad who was a smoker and, and that. And so I, I get what you're saying with that. Um, and so, and also that the fact that this is all happening in the middle of a pandemic and that your stress level, um, everyone's stress level during this is, you know, pretty enormous. And the last thing is, I think there's a really high percentage, like somewhere between 50 to 75% of first year students who change what they're doing because they get there and they realize it's not what they want to be doing. Mm-hmm. Yep. I got into, I got into education five times before I actually did it. I was a communications and advertising major before I switched to social work. Um, I also almost failed out of the communication advertising program. Um, that's when I learned that ADHD, uh, you know, so it's like, it's not, it's not going to be a smooth road there, but like, I think trust that you did your best and now it's time to let, you know, your kid fly with a little bit of support, but like from, yeah. from the background. Well, I also have a daughter that is more of a planner than Jacob is. So, but I know both of them need to experience before they um, go a different route. Yeah. So. Well, thank you so much for sharing this uh, with us. I hope this was, was helpful. Very helpful. I like getting other people's perspectives and one thing you also might want to consider doing is if you're on Facebook, uh, jump into a couple of different Facebook communities and talk to like the 18, 19 and 20 year olds in there. I think you'll get a lot of really and just maybe in the young 20s, like you might get a lot of really helpful perspectives uh, in there. So um, we are. Oh, huh, time. Look at that. Um, so thank you, everyone, uh, for, for asking questions. I know. uh uh, it's always hard to get to all the questions. I know we have some uh, questions that were not answered, but we do hope that you will return uh, next month um, with more questions. 
please take some time to check out our other podcast. And uh, Will, would you uh, would you close it out for us with a moment of that? I got a new pair of shoes today, and I think it was from a drug dealer because I don't know what he laced them with, but I've been tripping all day. <laughs> oh, oh my God, boo. <laughs> with that, we will see you next month. <laughs> Oh, that was awesome. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, Consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel von der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability, and if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. 
self-care is not selfish. And no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.